Welcome back, friends. We're now going to start to look at the uh, the text of the Imitations of Christ itself. It is comprised of four books. Um, Kempis wrote many texts in his life, and some scholars will compare the imitation of Kempis to that of Hamlet with Shakespeare. <laughs> it is considered in many ways um, his uh, opus, his, his work. And first, some of these scholars, a way of understanding the imitations might be to compare it to the Bible, not in inerrancy, not right. in, um, in, in a canonical type of a sense, but in a structural type of sense. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, that the Bible is a book, but it is composed of many books within it. And um, right. so that's true for the imitations. It's one book, but there's actually four books within it. And then a, a little bit unlike the Bible. So the Bible, if you start in Genesis, kind of continue through, you end at Revelations. It's kind of can be a, a, some sort of a chronological uh, situation. Right. Of course, you know, you can read First Samuel King, First and Second Samuel, then you get First Kings, then you get First Chronicles, and there's some other books in there. So sometimes it looks like there's an ebb and flow in a t chronological sense. But if you know how to read it as a the scriptures as a narrative, and even if you don't, but you come back at a little bit of a higher, you see this. For Kempis, if you read book two, book one, book four, book three, um, it doesn't seem to matter. They, 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 they don't. But I, you know, I didn't do it. I just went uh, as presented here in this um, edition. I actually think that your first reading through, Karen, I actually think it should be, like I said in a, in a prior episode, it's important to just read it and not overthink it. You just have to, because... You know, that that is essentially giving you uh, a, a ladder, right, that, that your that your mind can start to work on. And and then I, I do think that the Holy Spirit can you know, lead you through different areas. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you're going to talk about the different sections and, and what their titles are. Um, but really, um, to anyone who's thinking about reading this, I, I would. On your first going through, I would not approach this book as much as a devotional, as much as simply an instructive text, a kind of a textbook, and you just need to read it. And then after you have become familiar with it, then you then you can begin to approach it really as a true devotional. And that's where I think that you would do best to, you know, go slower and really meditate on different sections and and you know kind of like every once in a while you just open the Bible randomly to to a place and and you let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Um, I, I would that would just be my my caution. That is right. That, that's right. Um, I think so. Let's get to the thesis statement of the of the book as a whole and. That is, that it is a guidebook. It's a guidebook to a life of holiness whose end is God. The context in which we make the journey is this limited span of our earthly life. Holiness, I want to highlight, is defined as a living, vibrant relationship with God. If, right. It is a vibrant relationship. It isn't this ticking off. That, that is not Kempis's understanding. Um, and this thesis statement um, is very similar to the, the interior castle. We're preparing a room worthy of his majesty to dwell and moving swiftly to meet him. The, you know, well, it's interesting, Karen, that you say that. I, I, just in what you were just saying there, just made me meditate. Like, it's interesting that Thomas Akempis wrote a book called The Imitation of Christ, and that um, Saint Teresa of Avila wrote a book called The Interior Castle, because it really speaks to the the authentic 
element of the masculine and the feminine within the life of the church, right? The the agent, the actor, the one who goes out is that masculine element. And, and I'm not saying this is a male or a female thing. I'm saying that it's the masculine and the feminine element. And that both of those really, we need to embrace both of those to have, because we need to be both doers and receivers, right? Givers and receivers. And so um, anyway, I just thought, wow, that's really eloquent that they, that they came at it from that, that St. Teresa of Avila saw herself as, as the receiver, as the, almost the tabernacle, you know, like the Blessed Mother as being the tabernacle of Christ within her. Um, and that it is in that, I don't know, in that interior meditation that the woman truly is going to bring forth Christ into the world, right? And, and it is essential that they, that the, I mean, not only is it true that, I mean, we have both the active element where Thomas Akempis truly is forming men. We have to remember that. And man by, and I mean by the, you know, the XY chromosome man, he truly is forming these men who are going to become alter Christus, right? And St. Teresa of Avila truly was forming, I mean, in some sense, right? Somebody who's going to be like the Blessed Mother, who's going to be receiving Christ. But we who are among the laity, we play both roles, right? I mean, th this is going to be our, we have to both be bringing Christ into the world, but at the same time, making sure that we are taking time to effectively receive him into our interior life. Um, I, I just thought that was kind of interesting. That's beautiful. And that's why it was worth the effort to get this recording <laughs> straight. <laughs> All right, my friends, this is a little short one that, uh, that thesis statement, and so now we're going to turn to book one in the next episode. Till then, Fides Adracio.